Hi, everyone. So I am part two of the automatic chemical perception. So I'll try and um, explain kind of it's a very similar approach in terms of automatic splitting, but um, uh, maybe. So I will be talking about automatic chemical perception as the second part in this. Um, and in particular, I've designed a way to encode the smarts in a very specific manner such that it becomes very easy to do automatic chemical perception. And so for the outline, I'll talk about what the problem of parameter splitting is in force fields and um, why it's difficult and why it hasn't been really um, done very well so far. Uh, and then I will talk about the encoding scheme that I've designed to do this. And then finally, I will talk about with this new binary encoded smarts uh, encoding, how you can actually do automatic chemical perception. And finally, to put them into like a real use, I fit some force fields from scratch on alkanes and also looked at a single molecule that has kind of difficult physics in terms of the torsion profiles. And I fit a custom force field and got very accurate torsions with that. So the traditional approach to finding new parameters is usually you look at distribution of air um, after you've optimized the force field. And so, for example, I'd be showing in black, I have a mouse. So black would be like one parameter and then that's the air over that single parameter. And what you want to do is, if you're lucky, you see a bimodal distribution and you say, hey, I can split that and maybe I'll get um, better accuracy because those might be different chemistries. And if you do this, you can essentially define it as two different distributions. And the trick is you have to label each of your data either in one distribution or the other. But as you can see, it's uh, up in the air where you should assign the overlapping part um, because what you decide is either green or blue is going to define how your smarts pattern look because you have to distinguish between uh, the two groups somehow. And then once you refit, you're hoping those errors will go down, they'll kind of peak a little higher, less variance, and be more centered around zero, and you have a better force field. And so this is kind of problematic for a lot of cases. Um, here I'm showing a very lucky case where you have a bimodal distribution. And so I kind of call this chemical perception based on the physics. You're looking at the physics, you're looking at the air, and you're hoping that there's some chemical environment that can just split them out such that everything kind of works. But the problem with that, um, Tobias kind of mentioned a Bell space, which is all the splits. Well, it turns out making a smarts pattern to, uh, to encode every one of those partitions is, is simply uh, very challenging. For example, methyl hydrogens, you can't really distinguish them, but the Bell space would say they're distinguishable, right? And so the trick is, let's say you have some division here. Um, this is possibly not encodable by smarts. And so you got to be very careful with this kind of approach. On the other hand, um, kind of inverting the problem, if you do chemical perception based on a chemistry, you say, well, if I have a smarts pattern that this parameter uh, is associated with using the Smirnoff force field, uh, well, what partitions can we induce easily by looking at similar but not quite exact smarts patterns according to our original parameter? So, for example, if you had a carbon parameter, well, if I can just make a single edit, I'll induce some partition and such that everything is clearly labeled and defined. And then the hope is that that's actually a good parameter and we want to keep it. And so if you can kind of encode this in a way such that you're only looking at close smarts patterns, you're no longer solving the combinatorial problem it becomes more polynomial because you're searching an incremental smart space. And so when I first thought about this problem, um, it became very interesting to me. And there was two questions that I asked myself and to see if there was a solution to, um, and they were as follows. So given a smart pattern or given two, how do you determine if they're equal? This is kind of more solved. It's just an isomorphism check to see if the graphs match. No, no problem. 
the more tricky part was, well, what if I have a, if I have a smarts pattern, which pattern is closest or which pattern comes next? It's multidimensional, so it's kind of up in the air, but you can kind of see with this example, if I have an SP3 smarts pattern, uh, adjacent patterns would be an SP2 carbon or an SP3 carbon not in a ring. So notice I only change the smarts pattern by one little bit, I guess, or one little decision. And if you can programmatically encode that to some data structure, then it would be really to easy, easy to ask, well, if I can produce these smarts patterns, um, how many different partitionings can I generate? And are any of those partitions with the new smarts patterns actually good performing parameters that we want to key? Turns out most of the time, yes, there are some really good patterns. As you can see, it's usually going to be a very good idea to split out SP3 versus SP2. And we had to do almost no work to get that smarts pattern and distinguish that, that, that physics. And so very simple. I'm not going to talk about the actual encoding or the data structure, but it's just a bunch of bits. Uh, and you can manipulate them using bitwise operators. A very uh, um, more relevant example is this, let's say I have two smarts patterns or two graphs and I want to combine them or take the union. Well, this is just uh, a bitwise or operation on the entire graph such that you get a new pattern uh, with all of the bits kind of set. And so here, for example, the you have a carbon, this semicolon means and and then the colon means or so you're kind of checking to see if these three groups match and inside the group you can say it's either x3 or x4 and so you've you are able to match all of the, these two patterns on the left hand side in this larger condensed pattern and so when you do this so we're getting kind of to the point where it's going to be useful so if you have these multiple bits set of all the data that match the parameter. Now you can just look at the close patterns by looking at the single bits. And so you obviously have the four bits here, but keep in mind if a smarts pattern doesn't specify some primitive in the smarts pattern, all the bits are set and there's still all that chemical information contained into it. So for us, that's not useful right now, but it can do things like ask well, what if we did need to separate on rings or not? What would those molecules look like? Because right now we don't discriminate rings and maybe you need to. And you can do that by looking at these, these, simple, these simple bits. Uh, and then finally, to actually make a new parameter, uh, it's just one operation. So if this is your uh, original parameter and this is a bit that was uh, determined from the data, the only thing you need to do to make a new parameter is just intersect them or do the do an and on them, and that will combine them into one and voila you have a new parameter and you can check that with a modified force field with the new parameter fit it and see if there's actually an improvement so this is a very simple example but it works for bonds angles and torsions um, and it's just very general in the way it works because it's kind of the same problem, just more complicated on more complicated graphs. The last thing we need to do before we kind of get into the, the results of things, uh, because Smirnoff is a hierarchy, uh, you need to have some definition of subset. And so you would have to kind of ask and answer the question of whether this SP3 pattern is a subset of a general carbon parameter. Uh, this is obviously yes, because everything that uh, matches sp3 carbon also matches this carbon. Uh, but it does get a little more tricky if you have like a carbonyl pattern, because it has two atoms. Um, but you still have to say whether that is a subset of your general pattern. And this is also true. So you need to, when you do these operations, you must consider the fact that not all graphs have the same number of edges and nodes and stuff, um, but you, and you still need to have some mapping such that you can do the bitwise operations. With that in mind, um, the open force field is simply just a smart hierarchy that you can build. And so, for example, B2 here with this general bond parameter, SB3 to SB2, uh, is a general carbon-carbon bond. 
and then you specialize it with with the carbonyl oxygen here and that's why you have this kind of direct um, association inside the tree and now that you have a tree you can just iterate over it and check to see which parameters are performing poorly or not so poorly and you can target in on those and branch those parameters out and make new ones and then check to see if any of them are viable okay so to test the feasibility of this i wanted to my end goal is to make a transferable force field so i want to make this a very general approach i don't want to necessarily custom fit smarts to a single molecule and so the easiest smart space you can kind of look at is alkanes because those smarts patterns only differ by ring membership and hydrogen membership and so chemical space is very small and so if i can't do this well um, this some work would have to be done and so you start with a very general force field and so this would be just bonds and angles i leave torsions to the side for this because this was a first look um, and so I'm holding a lot of difficult things constant, and I'm just trying to fit simple valence terms. Uh, for the fitting objective, we, we use force balance regularly. Uh, this is no different. Uh, and we, uh, in this case, fit geometries and forces. And so that's, that's what we're trying to uh, fit in the physics of the problem. But then, because we don't want to just parameterize everything and make every smart pattern unique or every um, every little bit of the molecule its own parameter we have a chemical objective that essentially counts the the parameters to make sure that we don't have a overfitting set of parameters and then finally uh, another trick to this since i do have this binary encoding scheme it's quite easy to take a set of molecules and there's a lot of redundancy in the smart space and so if you look at all the torsion smarts you can start picking molecules out such that you have a minimal set of molecules where all the smart torsions are covered. And that would be a subset of all the alkanes I'm showing here. And then you use the rest for a test set. And so you have all of the smart patterns covered, but you don't necessarily use all of the molecules. Uh, and then because uh, you are in a very large space, you need a way to kind of prune things down such that you're not testing thousands and thousands of new smarts patterns on the regular. Um, and so this simple diagram just shows like a, a scoring system to kind of filter out bad parameters. Not all smarts patterns are going to be very useful. And so you'll see that in the optimization because there will be no change in the objective. And so the idea is with like the first scoring system, you potentially just want to examine the worst performing parameters, for example. And so you hone in on those and then you split those out and that would go to the W2 scoring system. And in this case, I do exactly one optimization step. Um, and this weeds out a lot of those parameters that don't really do anything because the objective either won't change or it will go up. Um, and at the same time, the chemical objective will also go up, which means it just won't be a viable candidate. But the ones that do drop will drop almost always in the first optimization. And so they become viable parameters. And then in the final step, you do a full fit and then take the best one. You take that one single parameter with the single best drop in the objective, refeed it into the force field. And so now you have a new force field with another parameter. And then you repeat the process over until you've kind of balanced out the chemical complexity versus the physical objective. Uh, and here are the results. And so you can see, starting from like uh, a very basic uh, two parameter system, once you add a few, you become uh, competitive with a hand curated set. So this would be Sage. So Sage has. Um, 10 parameters i think for the for, for the same molecules and i'm testing different kind of settings or hyper parameters of my scoring function functions um, and as you can see if we kind of target the worst performing parameter and then consider all the candidates you get kind of similar or you get good comparable results without checking all of this stuff and adding these new parameters that don't seem to be very useful in terms of improving the force field. Uh, this is the test set. And as you can see, uh, we do pretty much 
just as well as kind of these more expensive uh, calculations with that have to check a lot more candidates for for new parameters. Uh, to kind of show that directly here, you can see the number of parameters. And so all of the models increase uh, coincidentally to the same amount of parameters as Sage. And then you can either, I do perform parameter deletions. And so you can see the number drop sometimes. But in general, the, the quickest way, the quickest method uh, produce the same amount of parameters as Sage. And you can see here that for the W3 uh, scorings, um, you alternatively, if you check everything, you are doing 200, for example, 200 full force balance fits for every candidate. And that takes a, quite a while if you have more than 100 molecules. And so this was quite an expensive um, search to do. But if you're only looking at a few and you're very smart about things, you don't have to do that many fits. And this is the same with the W2. And so this is just showing that the green model that kind of has the best set of hyperparameters performs really well. And it's actually very uh, quick to generate these parameters. Uh, here is, so finally, so I talked about generating um, data sets based on uniqueness of smarts. And so what I didn't mention is that I would randomly select a molecule that satisfies some smarts pattern. And so here I'm showing what happens if you sample over that. Um, so I'm doing repeats, but I'm also changing how I define uniqueness in the smarts pattern. And so in the legend, I'm showing R and H, which means I only include ring membership in the smarts pattern. And so all the ring smarts is included in uni uniqueness, but not hydrogen and vice versa for this. So this H indicates we are not considering ring membership um, in our uniqueness. And so in this case, for example, you would be pulling out some cycloalkanes, but not other cycloalkanes. Or you can potentially get all straight alkanes in your training set. And then finally, the green means I'm considering both uh, smarts patterns such that I cover the entire chemical space of my data set. And then I compare it to random. And so here's the training. Uh, this is Sage to kind of give you a reference. And as you can see, the green kind of performs really well. And it also has a very low uh, standard error of the mean. And so it's a very consistent model if you pick the right chemical space to fit on. Testing is very similar, uh, except that what's very interesting is that you get really good performance on the uh, green, the RH. Uh, set um, with only a few parameters. And again, it's very low noise. And so it's a very stable uh, set of parameters that we've generated. Uh, and then finally, last slide. So I looked at the, um, just taking one molecule and fitting uh, bonds, angles, torsions, and impropers using the same method, except this time it's only on one single molecule. And so it's able to kind of fit it arguably overfit, but the idea was how accurate can I get with this method with building and finding new parameters. And here you can see the, the black is our standard open force field QM model, B3 lip, and uh, blue is the result of this work and then I'm comparing with Sage. And so you can see for alanine tripeptide for the kind of the important angles I find uh, omega, um, there are some kind of issues um, and this kind of approach will will find the right values and, and give you very good torsion profiles. Uh, so with that in mind, um, that's my work. So thank you very much for your attention. Let's take questions. Special thanks to Caitlin and Chris Bailey for kind of letting me bounce ideas off of them. This was a long time in the making. I've been working on this for a while now. I am a graduate student. This is my PhD uh, for the most part, whether I like it or not at this point. Um, and I'd also like to thank, thank Tobias because we have very similar interests and I meet him or I see him regularly uh, in the open force field calls uh, and also Pavan Baharis. He's also in the Mobley lab like I am and it's been great uh, bouncing ideas off of him as well. So with that, I'd like to take any questions. Thank you very much.